Uh, my name is Casey Ray, Future Music Coalition, VP for Policy and Education. Thanks for coming to uh, one of our more um, avant-garde breakout sessions, I guess I'd call it. We're going to be looking at antitrust law, monopoly, monopsony, all these crazy weird words that don't seem like they have any impact on the stuff that we do as musicians and creators, but you know, really actually impact our ability to make money, our ability to uh, enter the marketplace, and on what terms. So, I've got two brilliant guys here. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more context about what we're going to be looking at. My life uh, in music is kind of weird. I've been bootstrapping knowledge from all over the place. As a musician, there's a lot of theory uh, involved in just figuring out how to work an instrument, uh, engineering records. And then if you get into policy like I did, there's a whole uh, another set of concepts and ideas. So, if you guys think copyright is nutty, for example, um, you should check out antitrust law sometime. Uh, basically, what it comes down to is, is whether or not we're comfortable as a society, as creators, as producers, uh, with letting just a few big corporations own all the infrastructure, all the access points uh, that we use to communicate, to be entrepreneurs, to express ourselves creatively. Um, and also, if you're a fan, who puts a price point on access to culture? Is it an internet service provider like Comcast? Is it a consolidated media and entertainment conglomerates? Is it major broadcasters? Is it digital services? And what does that mean for the people who want to create or organize or innovate on a given platform? Um, we're talking about this today because the impact of antitrust and competition policy is felt across a lot of different sectors, including, including the music community. And I know that some of this is going to be uh, tough to wrap your head around. I'm here as, a, as a, somebody who's trying to learn it too, uh, so I'm with you. But uh, if we're interested in a future that's built on access and entrepreneurship, we have to figure out a way to talk about it. And these two gentlemen with me today are the perfect people to do that. Uh, Barry C. Lynn over here is, uh, has been described to me as the uh, last remaining uh, antitrust uh, superhero or something like that. Um, uh, Barry is the director of the Open Ma Markets Program at the New America Foundation. He's the author of two books, End of the Line and Cornered, uh, the latter which describes the dramatic return of monopoly to the American landscape. Um, both books and Le uh, Lynn's, Larry's uh, periodic articles in Harper's describe the concentration of economic power across a range of industries. And Thomas Frank is a hero of mine and also uh, we're super fans of the organization at FMC. He's a political analyst, historian, and journalist whose books include The Conquest of Cool, One Market Under God, and What's the Matter with Kansas. Um, I'm just going to open it up and just ask you guys, what's the root problem here? What are we really looking at and how can you describe it? Can I, can I just uh, say something a little correct, no, nope. uh, corrective there first, Casey, that, uh, that this is not a complicated issue. This is an extremely simple issue. It's about individuals versus power. What I was going to do, I thought I was going to uh, ask Barry things. So well, you're going to do it. Because I'm I'm, I myself am not an expert except for in this kind of like emotional way. Like I know how to get really angry about powerful corporations. It gets me really pissed off. It's like deep in the, uh, the, the Kansas grain. So when you get pissed off, I'm going to be like, and that's why musicians should be pissed off. So that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so got let's talk about here. musicians. Can I just say the first thing? Uh, is a, another friend of mine uh, who, I, who I've also interviewed is a, a guy called David Graeber. Uh, you might know him, the, the anthropologist, wrote a book about the, the history of debt. And he has a um, interesting way of analyzing what has happened to people like him, people like me, you know, he's an academic, I'm a writer, you guys are musicians. And uh, he says, basically, you know, there's, there's all of these f complicated forces out there that have conspired to make our lives miserable. But it's actually very simple. If you, if you, if you do something that you love doing for a living, the world will take that away from you. They'll, they'll make it, so you can't do, make a living at it, you right? It, it'll be bid down to nothing. But... Uh, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is one that sort of comes uh, to me from all of my experience in writing about politics in Kansas, and that is the predicament, this is going to sound really strange, the predicament of farmers. Farmers, okay? So farmers are always the sort of uh, uh, first victim of antitrust, or they were in the old days, uh, and to some degree they are again now, and I'm going to get buried. He's going to start talking about this in a moment, hopefully. But... Uh, the reason is that they're, they're, they do something that they love, they're completely disorganized, and when they go to take their, uh, their product to market, you know, their, their cattle or their grain or whatever it is, 
lo and behold, they face off against one or two really powerful companies. It's called concentration in an industry when it's all controlled in your locality or in your country or whatever it is, when it's all controlled by one or two or three companies. And uh, there's only this, you know, one or two companies buying and the farmer discovers that, you know, there's millions of farmers across America, they're totally unorganized and they're screwed, right? So the, everyone in agriculture, in, ag, in, 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 you know, big ag does really well. Very prosperous industry, except for one, and that's the farmer. And it's the same with you guys. You're in the most wonderfully, uh, you know, prosperous industry there is music, so wonderful. Everyone does well, except for the musician himself. It's a, you know, an ironic situation. Okay, so what I, I wanna get Barry in here, and I'm gonna shut up. The, the funny thing is that there was once a movement, you know, you say it's complicated and confusing, Casey, but there was once- It is to me, these there guys was once probably a, once upon it. a time in America when being against concentrated economic power was the most natural thing in the world. It just made sense to people like the way the law of gravity makes sense. And uh, you know, 100 years ago, and more, and Barry's gonna tell us that story if I will ever shut up, but th the thing is that the situation of 100 years ago, Standard Oil, you know, uh, JP Morgan, all the concentrated power, it's back. It's back today, and we need the movement that took those companies down. We need that movement back again. Okay, Barry, I'm shutting up now. Tell us how far back it goes. Uh, when the tell us about when the laws were passed, what they were pa why they were passed, why we used to have antitrust in this country. Yeah, I mean, actually, the uh, the laws really go back to before the the birth of the country. I mean, to really understand anti-monopoly, you got to go back to Boston in 1773, the Tea Party. You know, the 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 Tea Party. You know, some people say it was against taxation, but if you go back and look at the documents, at the letters. What you see was all these guys, you know, like John Hancock and Samuel Adams, and they said, we don't want a monopoly over commerce in this country. That monopoly being the British East India Company. So that was a rebellion against monopoly by a single company. And as you, know, you could really say that America was born out of, a monop out of a fight, a rebellion against monopoly. And it's, this was not for, because people were afraid that the British East India Company is gonna charge them more money, though it might have. What people were really afraid of was that this was gonna be another way to enslave people. You know, anti-monopoly fights or antitrust, you know, it sounds kind of technical, but what antitrust really means, if you sort of distill it down to its essence, it means liberty. And going back to the very first federal antitrust law, and that was the Sherman Act in 1890, you, know, you look at what Senator Sherman said, he goes, the purpose of this law, he didn't say it was for consumers, it wasn't for dr uh, driving down prices. He said, the purpose of this law is to protect our industrial liberty. Now that word industrial is a little funny, you know, it sounds like, you know, big factories or something, but what he actually meant when he said industrial liberty was that every one of us is industrious. We make things, we have ideas. Maybe some of us just grow grain or raise pigs, and that's our industry. Some of us have ideas, some of us make music. That's our industry, that's how we prove our industriousness. And what he said is that every person in our society, whatever their work is, when they go at the end of the day, or the, you know, on market day, to sell their work, there should be an open market for them. There should not be a single company. Like Tom was saying, there's, you know, nowadays farmers, when they go, uh, when they bring their chickens to market, there's no market, it's just one company for them. Maybe Tyson's at the end of that valley. At the next valley, it might just be J, uh, JBS. But it's just one company. That's not a marketplace. So what people understand about that kind of situation is that it, it's not merely a matter of well-being, of economic well-being, it's also a matter of liberty. Can't, do I have the liberty to interact with my neighbor freely? Do I have the liberty to interact with my neighbor and figure out what we want to trade with each other? So antitrust law, the whole purpose of antitrust law was to establish the markets, the open markets that would allow us to interact with each other freely. Tell me about the, how the law worked. What's non-discrimination? Non you know, the... Um, you know, discrimination is a, is a funny word. Uh, you know, we all, um, 
you know, going back to the, one of the things that Americans did, this is one of the elements of the revolution that was sort of the most important part. You know, before that, before the American Revolution, government meant someone like Louis Couture's. You know, and, and that was an autocrat. He had absolute power. So he could create property here. You know, on this person, he's going to bestow property. On this person, he'll take it away. That was a form of discrimination. So if you acted in a, in a way that he liked, he would discriminate in your favor. If he, you acted in a way he didn't like, he'd discriminate against you. So one of the things that Americans said is government has to be entirely non-discriminatory. There's no favor, fair field and no favor. And then what happened with antitrust is we realized that when companies became really large, maybe like a railroad, or if you allowed that company to discriminate, it was doing the same thing as Louis Couture's was. It was picking a winner and picking a loser. It was discriminating against its, uh, for its friend and discriminating against its, its, the person that was, you know, raising a problem. So this, one of the parts of antitrust, antitrust is really kind of two things when you boil it down. Part of it is make markets wherever possible, open markets that protect our liberties to interact with each other. And in cases where you have something really, really big, something big that you, you can't get around, like a railroad, you, you, know, you can't really create competition in railroads. And we might not be able to create competition in certain kinds of online services. But if you have anything that's really big, then you have to make sure that it cannot discriminate. The people behind it cannot discriminate. Because as soon as you allow someone to use a railroad to discriminate, as soon as you allow someone to use Amazon to discriminate, as soon as you allow someone to use YouTube to discriminate, that is a power of governance that subverts our rights and leads to concentration of wealth and power. In fact, well, I was going to say the classic historical example, but we probably shouldn't go there, is Standard Oil, that, that, that used, the, used the power of railroads to drive all their competitors out of business by cutting shady deals with the, with the uh, railroad lines, or with the one railroad line. But there is, I mean, we're, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, where there's an example right in front of us right now. Uh, you mentioned it briefly, Amazon, but uh, Franklin Foer wrote about it in the New Republic. Paul Krugman has finally seen the light and got interested in this. Tell us what's going on with Amazon. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so outrageous when you think about it. They've captured what percentage of the, of the market? You know, it's, uh, book markets, as you guys know, there's all these little sub, like a market is usually made up a whole bunch of different markets, little sub markets. So in books, there's a bunch of sub markets, like eBooks. Amazon has about 65% of eBooks. Uh, it has about 40% of all new books, of um, sort of long tail books, books that are just out, you know, all books out there. They have about 90% of that marketplace. University presses, 70, 80, 90%. Small presses, 70, 80, 90%. So it is the dominant player in books in this country. There's really no way around it if you're a publisher, if you're an author. So what they do with this power is because right now, it used to be, they would have been limited in the use of their power by anti-discrimination laws. But for a variety of reasons, most of them really stupid, we got rid of those, <laughs> yeah, we, we got rid of those, those uh, powers, uh, those, those limitations about 30 years ago. So Amazon has this monopoly. You have to ride Amazon's rail to get to market if you're an author. But Amazon, because there's no one protecting us against its discrimination, they could say, well, you, you're my friend. You get to write. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shine a light on your book. And you, I don't like you, so you, you know what? Just forget it. We ain't selling that book. And so they can do that every day, book by book, author by author. But they've actually gotten into a big fight recently with a particular publisher called Hachette. And what they want is like they, they have the power to price other people's books, other people's wares. That's a problem. But what they also do is they uh, have this power to extract all these fees for writing your rails. So it's like maybe the invoice price of a particular book is $10. Well, okay, so they pay you that $10 for selling your book at, you know, at $14. They also carve back all these fees on the back end. They might charge you $5, $6, $7 for various kinds of marketing fees, for warehousing. 
So if they, in this case with, with Hachette, they want to impose a bunch of fees on Hachette because they have the power to do so. And, and Hachette, for a variety of reasons, has said, no, we're going to fight this. So what Amazon did is they just cut them straight off from the market. They don't get to uh, ride the rail. They've actually modified that a little bit. So it's actually, if you go and try and buy a book that's published by a Hachette author on Amazon, you can't get it tomorrow. You can't get it in two days. You can't get it prime. You can't get it at a discount. You might be able to get it at invoice price in three weeks. But didn't they make an exception for a Hachette title by Paul Ryan that you could get? They did make a, uh, uh, they made a couple of exceptions. A fellow named Paul Ryan had a book come out. I think it's called The Way Forward. And it came out on August 19th of this year. And on August 20th, Paul Ryan was on Squawk Box on CNBC, and he said, and they were talking about, him, about his new book, and he said, you know, it's a funny thing about that new book is you can't buy it on Amazon right now. It's not available. So um, while he, apparently, I haven't actually checked to, to find out exactly when, but apparently while he was on TV, suddenly Amazon turned it on. <laughs> now, were they, trying, were they afraid that this guy might end up being president? and bring the power of the U.S. government against them, perhaps? Or, you know, are they, you know, just sort of, do they actually support Ryan's kind of politics and do they want to boost him and realize they made a mistake? We don't know. But it proves that their power to discriminate, they will use it even in the cases of books that are overtly political in nature. Ask another quick question. I know you got a whole ton of stuff there, but look, so you're talking about riding the rails on a company that, that you know, is moving bits around essentially, but there's a, an actual, in the digital space, there's the internet service providers who are the rails, right? And there's a uh, proceeding right now at the FCC where Comcast is trying to purchase Time Warner Cable. Keep in mind that Comcast already owns NBC Universal, which is a major motion picture and television studio. So for our folks, I think you can kind of see uh, what vertical integration might look like in this modern age. Um, you know, the farmer stuff is really awesome, but can you talk a little bit about what the dangers are in, in that universe? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's really two issues there. One is the fact that you can discriminate on these, uh, you know, with, with data, and you can sort of uh, favor some data and disfavor others, favor you know, some people's data and disfavor other people's. But the other issue you raise there is, is vertical integration. And that's just a fancy word for, well, I own the rails, but I also am engaging in, say, raising chickens. So I'm gonna use my railroad to bring my chickens to the market, and I'm not gonna bring your chickens to market because you're my competitor. Or maybe you get to ride, but you gotta pay a whole bunch of extra money. Well, that's actually the case, certainly in Amazon. Amazon is a major publisher now. So when Amazon uses its immense power to favor some companies and disfavor others, one of the companies it's favoring is Amazon. Yeah, and what and if you... What if you invent a new and better chicken, like it's a robot chicken that shoots lasers out of its eyes, and you know, you have these, you're, you're like Amazon or Comcast or whatever, you get your regular old chickens, and you know that this new chicken might really take off, and you want to like not have that available, right? If you're Amazon, robot well, chicken. if you are Tyson's, you don't want that robot chicken. You know? <laughs> so, you are going to keep that robot chicken from getting the market. If you have the power, if you control the market, then you can do that. And this is the case with, uh, you know, if with what we see now increasingly in the digital space as well, which is that you can favor certain companies, disfavor other companies, or favor your own product. I mean, one of the most outrageous mergers that were allowed, what was allowed in this country in recent years was the Comcast-NBC merger. That is a violation of principles that go back beyond the founding of this country. So you get me going, and then I forget what I was gonna, I was gonna talk to you about. I mean, but the, okay, the, 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 I wanted to point out that the, you know, the world, well, you, you guys have done it, we're just, there's monopolies everywhere. And it's funny, when the internet revolution began, do you remember all the promises? It was going to be the exact opposite. It was going to empower the individual. And yet it seems like all it's done is build monopolies from, you know, everywhere you look. It's as though this is the only business strategy. Nobody wants to build a robot chicken. Everyone, everyone just wants to, you know, figure out how to crush their competitors by, uh, you know, treating them unfairly. What is it? Is it I'm, okay? I, I, we know the answer to that. That's like that's capitalism. That's what they call it. There's a word for it. They call it capitalism. Another anecdote. 
uh, I used to know this, this guy called Andre Schifrin, ran a publishing house. <clears throat> and uh, in his memoirs, he was describing uh, you know, an event in the 1960s when I believe he worked for a Random House or something like that, and they merged with another publishing house. The next day, they got a call from the Department of Justice. It was very upset. They're like, you know, you, you, you've done this merger. You didn't ask us. You know, we're going to have to look into this because we don't know if we're going to allow it. And they finally did allow it because it was only 1% of the market. But they were still, you know, they were, they were, they were careful about it. 1% of the market. And they got investigated by the Department of Justice. Today, Amazon, you're saying 70, 80 90% and our government doesn't care. Our government doesn't give a damn. Well, we'll find out. Beer. Tell us about beer. Well, we Tell us about glasses. Yeah. And, and Amazon, we, glasses. Yeah. <laughs> we will find out with Amazon uh, whether the government gives a, a damn in the next few months. Uh, but, you know, th this is up to this point. When you look around our economy, what you find is that the government has not given a damn about hardly anything for a really long time. You know, uh, Tom just mentioned glasses. Uh, you know, if you guys, I see a bunch of folks wearing glasses. You know, if you go out shopping for glasses, you know, you could go, it seems like there's an immense number of companies to choose from. You know, you might, you can go to Pearl Vision or you can go to Lens Crafters or you can go to Target Optical if you got less money or Sears Optical or Macy's Optical, um, Sunglass Hut. Well, in every single one of these instances, you're actually dealing with the same company. This is, it's an Italian company called Lexotica. And over the past 10, 15 years, they just bought up. Because there's no one watching the store here in America. They came to America and they just bought up all this retail. Literally, not, no one watching the store. So they said, well, we'll own the store. And that way we get to set the prices. Well, Lexotica is also a manufacturer. So they want to own the stores partly because they want to sell their product and not other people's product. So one of the ways they do, they've used this power that they took over retail to promote their own manufacturing. There was a company called Oakley, for instance, a sunglass company, and they just used it, their power to squeeze Oakley into submission so that they could buy it. And now they own it. You know, we saw that in radio, because when the radio companies consolidated, what they did was they used that power to deal with their one customer, which was the major labels, and extract a certain price in, in order to access the airways. And secondarily, the same wine, different bottles phenomenon, or the different glasses phenomenon, bears true in music because we had format categories that uh, had different names, but basically played more or less the same songs across categories, and that really closed down all the access points. I have a real quick question about, uh, you know, sometimes the government does give a crap. Uh, it looks at the merger, it decides to approve the merger, but it applies certain conditions on those mergers. Those are sometimes referred to as consent decrees. Can you explain to me what those are to the audience? Yeah, I mean, a consent decree is, okay, we're going to let you do a deal, exactly as you said, but you have to, there's these, they call them behavioral remedies. You have to behave, and we're going to be watching over you. We got our big stick. Now, you know, usually those, those remedies tend to be flawed in the, in, the, in the origins. You know, it's a bad idea in the first place, and they're just trying to pretend as if they did something. But even if there actually is something in the remedy that's working, the thing about government in our country is that it's always changing. So, well, this year, it's the Obama administration. Two years from now, who's going to be in power? We don't know. There's a company called Microsoft. This is one of the problems with behavioral remedies or just any kind of uh, these kind of remedies that you when, you when you kick the can down the road. Microsoft got caught back in the 1990s favoring its uh, browser over other browsers. It was a railroad problem in, when it came to personal computers. Clinton administration got rolled into doing something about it. They got rolled into doing uh, something about it by a bunch of state AGs, attorney generals down in places like Iowa. They were said, this is embarrassing to, to have a company engage in these kind of practices. So they forced the, uh, the Clinton administration to take them on. They actually won that case. The U.S. case against antitrust, the United States won. We won. We the people won this case against Microsoft. As soon as the, uh, the, the, the Bush administration came in, they said, you know, Let's just set that aside. So it's one of the problems with any kind of remedies that are focused on behavior that has to, in which you need to have someone watching over with a stick is that, you know, within two years, three years, four years, there's probably going to be someone else watching over. 
and that person may well be friends with the monopolist and they're going to stick the, put the stick down. So, so a structural remedy is, uh, is, is more effective. Was there ever a time when we did, when we had structural remedies? Yeah, for most of, you know, going back, you know, for most of history, for 200 years in this country, what we focused on was making markets. And that means, you know, markets, there's all these people who talk about the free market, you know, as if it's like some kind of god, some kind of mechanical uh, uh, machine out there that just kind of grinds through all of us and all the material of the world and turns out certain outcomes. You know, it's like the actual thing about markets is that they're institutions, and they're institutions that people make. And we make these institutions so, uh, to govern how we compete with each other, so that when we compete with each other, the result is productive competition, not destructive competition, and the preservation of our rights. So um, during that period when we were making markets, when we focused on making markets, what we focused on was getting the structure right. And just to understand how radically different this country was not so very long ago, one of the structural approaches was we're not going to have national retail brands. There's not going to be any Walmart. There's not going to be a Target. There's not going to be a Staples. We're just going to have, when it comes to stores, there's just no reason to have a company that big. So They would say efficiency, though. How would you respond yeah. to that? They do say efficiency. That's actually what they use to revolutionize the law. They say that Walmart is more efficient than having a hundred different companies doing the same thing. Sure, it's more efficient yeah. if you've got three major labels and they only have to talk to you know four radio station programmers too. And, and they put out such wonderful yeah. music too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So efficiency is actually this is the, you know this is it's great that this was brought up because the word efficiency when anyone brings that up that's actually the, the that should be an alarm bell goes off. Because the thing about law, law is not about efficiency. It never has been. You know, going back 800 years, you know, it's like we weren't back in the, when the, with the Magna Carta. They were not seeking efficiency. They were seeking liberty. And time and again over the years, you know, you, Jefferson, Brandeis, whoever it is, said, you know what? We don't want efficiency. We just want freedom. We want liberty. Then 30 years ago, these guys came along. They're, you know, some of you may know, uh, heard about them. It's the Chicago School. Uh, Tom's written a lot about these guys. Actually, you went to the Chicago. So I probably know some of those folks, don't you? Uh, these guys came along and they said, you know, if, if we just change our laws and aim at efficiency, then the consumer is going to do so much better than he's doing now. And they did. They changed the laws. And essentially, by changing the one word from, from seeking uh, uh, markets, liberty through markets, to we're going to seek to improve the welfare of the consumer through efficiency. They revolutionized every antitrust and a monopoly law on the books in one little flip of a switch. And that was done 30 years ago. And that's actually what set us on this path to where we are today. Okay, but look, can I just point out, so the, it was the Reagan administration and the man who developed the theory, you're the one that told me about this, was a character named Robert Bork who you might remember, because Reagan nominated him to the Supreme Court, and yeah, he didn't get there. And it became a famous uh, cause celeb on the right when, uh, when Bork went down. But he had That's fun his... to say, when Bork went down. Bork... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but he, he had his way with us nevertheless, didn't he? <laughs> Bork, uh, Bork's ghost is still, uh, you know. But here's the thing, that was, uh, that was the Reagan revolution. These were uh, diehard fans of the free market, this is when the, you know, that, that school of thought became dominant. It's been 30 years since then. We've had Republicans, we've had Democrats. You just mentioned Bill Clinton, deregulated um, uh, telecom. Uh, Barack Obama, could he do something about this if he felt like it? Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, you mentioned Reagan and you mentioned Bill Clinton, but Reagan started the process. This, you know, he, he untethered the monopolists. But the person who really sort of, you know, fed them and opened every gate, every other gate was Bill Clinton. You know, so this is not a one party versus the other. You know, but, but you know, with Bill Clinton, it's like, who pushed for the consolidation of the defense industrial base? That was Bill Clinton. Who unleashed the old energy companies? That was Bill Clinton. Telecommunications, Bill Clinton. Banks, Bill Clinton. So this is not Reagan is bad and the Democrats are good. 
Republicans, bad. Democrats, bad. What could Obama do? Obama could like actually uh, revolutionize this tomorrow. You know, I mentioned before that there was just kind of a, a little switch in terminology was what unleashed this revolution. That terminology can be switched back tomorrow. Because the, where that terminology exists is inside of this thing called the guidelines that people use for the enforcement of all these antitrust laws. So if you just switch the guidelines back, then suddenly the laws would start operating in a different way. So that could be done essentially by decree. Now, Congress could stand up and say, oh, we don't want that. But I think even this Congress would not stand up and say, oh, yeah, well, actually, we want monopoly. So the Obama administration right now could actually revolutionize this approach uh, to enforcing our laws tomorrow. Uh, will they? How do we, how do we um, get him interested in doing that? I mean, the, the man has, has, has shown zero. Well, uh, wait, this is another thing that you told me about. When, you know, this is not that far-fetched. When Barack Obama was running for president in 2008, one of the ways that he beat Hillary Clinton during the primaries was going to Iowa, talking to farmers, telling those farmers, I'm going to do something about Monsanto and Tyson's and the, all the other agricultural monopolists. Uh, he followed through about 0%, maybe 2%. He didn't do anything is what I'm saying. How do we get him interested in, in, uh, in doing something? I guess we demand that he do something. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's, if, when you look at it, it's pretty much, you cannot find a group of Americans, except for the top 1%, that are not now under the sway of some power that threatens not merely their economic well-being, but their political well-being, their liberties. So it's pretty much 99% of us are deeply screwed if we don't do something. You know, it's not just music, it's not just authors, it's um, this, you know, those engineers out in Silicon Valley, the, the computer engineers. You know what folks found out a couple years ago? They found out that Steve Jobs one day got pissed off that, that other companies were hiring his workers. So he got on the phone, he called up Eric Schmidt and he said, let's not hire each other's workers. Come on, let's not be stupid. So they actually, Apple and Google and Intel created a cartel, a hiring cartel. But that's classic illegal behavior, isn't it? Isn't it? Am I yeah. wrong? Yeah, yeah, they, it was illegal. It is illegal. Uh, the administration actually, after this was pointed out to them, they had to do something, so they gave a little pat, a little sort of a rap on the wrist. And they said, don't do that anymore for at least five years. <laughs> Can we do questions? We got about five minutes, but before, uh, while well, you guys are filing up, I, I was kind of curious, like, you know, what is that pressure point? I mean, yeah, we got to put pressure. We got to wake them up to the idea. A lot of folks have different communities that they're working in. Uh, you know, how do you make something that seems abstract that you both did an excellent job in unabstracting? How do you get this to make sense for people so they can? And what are the channels for for influence and pressure that can be brought? Can I just throw something in here really crazy? So whenever I speak to audiences about this. This is something everyone agrees with. Everybody knows about it from personal experience and it makes them really mad. The problem is always, you know, the, well, there's no movement. Barry, you should talk about this. There used to be what they called an antitrust movement in America. Uh, it's, well, Barry's the last, the last representative of it. Uh, the first. Um, <laughs> the, um, I'm, I'm the bottleneck through which this is passing. The, um, you know, it, it's, I have a friend named Zephyr Teachout. Some of you may have heard of Zephyr Teachout. Um, she and another friend of mine named Tim Wu, they decided back on June 1 to run against a fellow named Andrew Cuomo in the Democratic primary up in New York. So on June 1, Zephyr Teachout and Tim Wu got into that race um, with no name recognition and no money. And they went around with no money and no name recognition and they attacked Cuomo for many things, but mainly for corruption and for concentration, for being a friend of the monopolist. And they, they bad-mouthed Comcast and Amazon, and they said, we are, uh, 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 we're in favor of family farms and family business. And they went from zero name uh, recognition and zero money. They had 35% of the vote 
in the primary on September 9th against one of the meanest politicians in America. They went like that, singing that song. So I, we can actually win this if we go out and sing this song together and do it in the political arena. This is not a matter of going and begging our, uh, begging our regulators to do something. Our regulators ain't gonna do something until we get together politically and force them to do something. And there were two revolutions, but people forget in this country, there were two revolutions. There was the revolution back in 1776, and we all know about that, but there was a second one, because we all know that there were plutocrats on this earth 100 years ago. You know, we kind of grew up kind of hearing the word plutocrat, and it seemed like, you know, like, like brontosaurus or something. It's like something that used to wander the land, and then they died off, and we don't really know why. Well, they died off, it wasn't a, meteor striking the earth that killed off all the plutocrats. It was actually a bunch of people getting together and organizing and taking control of the government and, 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 and sending people to office in the state legislature and down here at Capitol Hill and saying, people who were gonna take on the monopolist. So there was a second revolution in this country. It started in 1912 with something called the New Freedom. It continued on into the 1930s with something called the New Deal. And it continued right into the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And that's how it was that we had an economy that was made for regular folks, regular citizens, into the 1980s. It's because other people, our grandfathers and grandmothers made it so. So we get some questions in. I see Deborah over here. Yes, hi, Deborah Newman. This makes me really kick myself for not having taken antitrust law in law school. It's one of the few courses I didn't have time to, and it's so important. Um, it's very interesting, and the historical perspective on these issues is great. Uh, I actually want to bring it to the music industry for a couple of different things, two different things. One, which is currently in process, is the consent decrees for the two biggest PROs, ASCAP and BMI, that go back to 1941 that have allowed certain kinds of music services to flourish because they can go to two and then the third CSAC, which is not operated under a consent decree, organizations to get all of the rights from all of those organizations to be able to publicly perform music. And uh, the publishers, some of the big publishers, as you know, are not happy with the rates that they are getting and they've been trying to pull out certain rights. And so now there's a movement to try to either abandon or modify the consent decrees and the DOJ is in the midst of that investigation. Um, you may or may not know the details of any of this, but I'm curious when that process happens, how does that process work? The DOJ, it's the antitrust division of the DOJ. I assume that reports to the Attorney General, to Eric Holder, I'm not even sure about that. And the variety of outcomes that could come out, what are they? Are they abolishing the consent decree, revising the consent decree, or keeping it like it is? Are those the three choices? What is the possible outcome? Can you describe that process? But real quick, I just want to remind everybody that ASCAP and BMI, um, they collect and distribute royalties to songwriters and publishers for the use of musical works in broadcast transmissions, they're called public performances, or in venues. So it's a really big marketplace, and historically it's, it's generated a lot of income for publishers, but also songwriters. Uh, under the blanket licenses from the consent decrees, radio stations, broadcasters, and venues are able to, um, you know, write a check, obtain the blanket license, and basically perform what they want out of this repertoire. Uh, the danger, uh, or the question is, right now, um, the major publishers, there's only three of them left on the planet, uh, feel very strongly that if they were able to withdraw um, partial rights, their digital rights, for example, for internet radio like Pandora or whatever, they would be able to achieve higher rates. The worry is that the blanket licenses don't just cover the three uh, major big publishers, they also uh, include smaller songwriters and independent publishers. Thousands. But I would love to kick it back over, maybe you can describe the process. Keep in mind that consent decrees are non-binding, this is a non-admission of guilt. When they came under these consent decrees, it was a way for them to get out of being sued by the United States government. Yeah, I mean, I think the key thing with all, it's, you know, it's just playing off of that, that these are non-binding, is also they're very political, you know, so, you know, and we saw this with Dodd-Frank a few years back. You pass a law, but then you got to dog that law every day. You got to dog Congress, uh, you know, you got to dog the agencies to make sure you get the rules uh, uh, structured in a way that the, the law actually works. And this is true with anything. 
So, you know, and, and just, you know, it, uh, yes, the DOJ actually, uh, I mean, the antitrust division of the DOJ reports to Holder, Holder reports to the White House. Uh, and actually just to, so you understand that this is not some bunch of tech, uh, these guys like to say they're, they're technicians. You know, they're just like studying the science. And we're gonna choose the scientifically perfect outcome. It's like, no, when, you know, it's like when, when Ticketmaster and Live Nation who had their merger on the table. That was my next question. Like yeah. So yeah, so when that, table, when that merger was on the table, everyone thought, wow, the Obama administration, that's, that's such an easy target. They're just going to toss that out day one. Well, there was a fellow named Rahm Emanuel who was working in the White House, and there's a fellow named Ari Emanuel who was on the board of uh, Live Nation, so it didn't happen. Yeah, politics is politics. Um, can we get just one more in and then... And Come on. Rahm Emanuel? <laughs> this, this guy is like unusually... Uh, well, yeah. So, so that being said, um, I think uh, I'm an attorney and I get very confused often uh, in these discussions about antitrust law because I think not only do you have issues of uh, horizontal or vertical control, uh, but almost every major case um, deals with a completely different set of facts and a completely different set of players. So I'm not defending Amazon right now, but I want to switch up the narrative a bit to describe or to give an example of what I'm talking about. So Amazon um, has this unique business model. They reduce prices um, to the extent that they do not make a significant profit. What that means, in essence, is that they're not playing uh, what could be considered the traditional capitalist game. They're not increasing, um, uh, let's say, gross domestic product or whatever measure you want. Um, they're not increasing consumption. They're actually keeping it pretty steady in terms of their own universe. They have competitors. They do have very large competitors, for instance, Google, in the same marketplace, trying to distribute the same things. Because Amazon plays this possibly anti-capitalist game, they increase their market share by giving the consumer a good deal. Therefore, people want to use the Amazon marketplace uh, because they have that market share. They might not always have it, but they certainly have it for now. So to accuse Amazon uh, of being usurious, of taking advantage of their strength when they're not, in fact, increasing their capital to the extent that others would like to, is actually playing into the hands of those competitors who are quite large, um, in some cases perhaps larger than Amazon if in other marketplaces, uh, which suggests that they have um, larger areas of vertical and horizontal control, um, is actually to uh, play into the hands of those usurious capitalists, despite the fact that you're accusing Amazon of being uh, the market controller and being the one that's being usurious. So if you flip the narrative that way, um, it seems that the politics can completely change and the interests involved are completely different. I, I've seen this, this uh, I know my friend uh, Matt Iglesias kind of put out this uh, story a couple weeks ago uh, that Amazon is somehow acting in a philanthropic manner. Uh, I mean, one, there would not be a single investor in that company if there were philanthropy. So uh, there's, uh, what they're doing is something called loss leading. Mm -hmm. So we're very familiar yeah. with that in the music industry. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what that's what you guys are, yeah. right? Okay. Basically, yeah, you guys are the candy, right? So they, you know, they just throw you out on the ground so people run in, right? So and that's what Amazon was doing with books. They throw the books out on the ground, people run in, then they rip off all the information of these people. They suck them dry of all their information, and they steer them over to you know buy something else like a television or a diaper bag, you know, or something. You know, so there's a there's a lot of uh, it's it's a brilliant strategy what they're doing, but it is absolutely. A but there's, there's there's another example too when the predatory pricing. You know, it's low prices aren't always necessarily evidence of of, of benevolence. I mean, the Standard Oil did this all the time to ruin a competitor, and then when the competitor's gone. I'm not, I'm not claiming that they're being benevolent, simply that their system isn't, uh, let's say, the alternative to Amazon. Uh, you're defending people that might be more usurious. For instance, Google, who wanted to give away books for free through some library uh, excuse. You will never see me defending Google. I don't think you'll see any of these folks defending Google. 
Um, you know, just saying that Amazon's a problem does not mean that Google is also not a problem. Right. And just, you know, once we take on Amazon, doesn't mean that the next, you know, the next thing you want to take on is, uh, is the same practices by Google. So, um, you know, what we have to focus on is, um, you know, what do we want out of this? And what we want is an open and competitive marketplace. We want a marketplace that allows every single person to go in and interact as cleanly and invisibly with their neighbors as possible. What we see with Amazon and with a couple other companies is this play to become super middlemen. That, you know, it's like Amazon, if we look at where they are now and, you know, not even like five years from now, not now, they are the master mediator of the book market. They choose what to sell you. They decide what books you're going to buy to a certain extent. Now, you could push through what they're pushing on you, but it's like what we're seeing here is a master mind emerging, and it's not a benevolently disposed mind. But the, the we gotta we gotta wrap it up because we gotta strike this set and get ready for the next panel. Because for the first summit ever, we're pretty much on time, right? This is amazing. I want to thank Barry and Tom. You guys are amazing, and thanks for letting me hijack a little bit. It was fun for me. Uh, we'll find ways to keep this conversation going. <laughs>